Good evening. I'd like to call to order the City Council meeting of Monday, October 15, 2018. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call, please. Okay. Albertson, absent. Bueller, Danforth. Here. Lalum, absent. Manti, absent. Roby. Here. Solom. Here. Thorson. Here. Bill Howard. Here. Why? Thank you. Thank you. And before we get started tonight, um, I would like to mention that. Since our last city council meeting, former city council member Russ Wilkins passed away. And um, I would like to take a moment of silence to remember him. He was a great councilman and a, a really great man. And he's dearly missed by many. So let's take a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, on a little bit nicer note today, we had the 10,000th passenger board an airplane at the Watertown Regional Airport. So that makes today a very happy day. Good day for all of us. So moving on, the first item on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Oh, a whole bunch of them. I will say um, moved by Y and second by Roby. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. The second item is public comment, and this is the time set aside for anyone to come forward and talk about something not on the agenda. I don't see anybody that wants to do that, so move on. Item number three is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion and second? Moved by Vilhauer, second by Bueller. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item four is 2018 Street Improvement Projects Assessment Roll, resolution number 18-42. I'll look for a motion and second for approval, and then I will open the public hearing. Is there a motion? Motion by Danforth, second by Bueller. Okay, this, I will go ahead and open the public hearing and um, let Colin describe this project. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this was an assessment project uh, for the curb and gutter along third, the north side of Third Avenue Southwest. Um, this had uh, many missing missing pieces of curb and gutter, and it was uh, we were redoing that road, so we asked the, the adjacent landowners if they would like to participate in an assessment uh, to establish that curb line uh, all the way along the north side. And it was passed, and that's where we are today. Um, we did. Uh, uh, send out and I contacted a couple just recently landowners about a minor adjustment that we had to make um, but I guess that's where we are today all right is there anyone else that would like to talk about this if so come forward see none I will close the public hearing Chris I guess I okay sorry I'll just say a little bit as a refresher on the special assessment process that we're at now. Um, for item four, five, and six, those will, after this meeting, be turned over to the county so that they're aware of them. That then gives the opportunity from November 1st until the November 30th for these um, property owners to come and pay um, their assessment to the city. If after November 30th it hasn't been paid, that is the time when it's turned over to the county and will be put on the property taxes for 2019 for the 10 years. So, Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments? 
Councilman Roby? Uh, this is a resolution. Are there any, there's nothing to do with an ordinance change here. Uh, it's just, it's just stating the facts as they are. Right. And this project is done, right? This project is completed. Yes. Councilman Vilhauer? I've got a question in general. We, we spell out in the resolution, I think, in both four, or all three, four, five, and six, a 10% interest rate. I know we had someone appear before us a few months ago uh, expressing some concerns, and we had talked about uh, possibly a, a lower interest rate in that case. How does, how does an individual uh, apply or come to us, or what, what's the procedure if there is a request for a lower interest rate? Sorry. Um, that actually should have probably been done before this point because this is how it's um, posted for the notice of hearing is at the 10%. I did go back and do some searching, and we have only at one time ever done anything under the 10%, and that goes back to, like, 1997 is when I um, – there was one instance where it was lower. Otherwise, it's always been the 10% on our special assessments. Anything else? All right, I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item number five is the 2018 Street Improvements Project Assessment Rule Resolution Number 18-43. And this is the 26th Street Southeast one, which was um, discussed briefly in the um, committee meeting. So I'll look for a motion and second for approval, and then I'll open the public hearing. Moved by Councilman Bueller. Second by Councilman Thorson. Um, okay, Colin, would you please review this? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, to extend 26th Street Southeast uh, to the north. We are still mission, missing a little section to the north of this, but this is an assessment project uh, that was um, actually sent in motion by one of the landowners that eventually bought the other side. So as you see, uh, we only have two landowners, uh, but three lots that are being assessed for this project. This is a, a, a new road construction, uh, so that includes curb and gutter, asphalt, um, storm sewer, sanitary sewer, water. Um, this project is still under construction, uh, so it's not complete. Um, okay. Uh, is there anyone in the public that would like to speak on this? I'll open the public hearing for that. I don't see anyone, so I will close the public hearing. And we did discuss moving forward with this project um, that there we maybe shouldn't pave it this year. Um, what we should do with the water services, and we'll be discussing that amongst the staff. But meanwhile, we can move forward with the assessment, and um, we would recommend that. The staff recommends that. So um, does the council have any questions before I take action? Councilman Danforth? Mayor, if I can. I, I, we had a very good discussion about this in our finance and public works meeting prior to now, and, and in my opinion, there just seems to be a lot of unanswered questions on this, and I would be hesitant to approve the assessment if we don't know truly what and when we're going to be doing something. Is there, what's the downside of not doing this assessment today and doing it when we do know more of what the intentions are and the timing of those intentions, what's the downside? Excuse me. My understanding of the downside would be that we would not be able to make the statutory deadline to get those assessments on the 2019 tax roll. And so uh, my understanding would be that we would carry that cost until till next year. Um, so if you approve it today and we end up, you know, something changes substantially, for example, we decide not to do the road in some odd event, then uh, there is procedure in statute that allows us to come back and amend the assessment role. And then we would just inform the county to reduce the tax uh, tax assessment, and their 2020 tax would then go down from 2019. So there is a process in the event that the detail that we are asking for, I think we should have, there is a process that if this gets put off, that either the 
landowner or the city can go back and say we need to pull that back and, and do an adjustment then as long as there is that process then i'm fine with it and there has been cost expended already mm -hmm. so if the project stopped today there would still be cost to be recouped so i would think it'd be advisable to move forward on the assessment today all right councilman Vilhar. i got a question again procedurally i mean colin you said this is not this is not done but is the the dollar amount that we've got in front of us is that a good number or how do we deal with it if, if that is not the ultimate dollars that we're looking at yes and I'm gonna actually refer this to Matt and and or Kristen uh, that we did have a long discussion between the three of us on how to go about this one because you'll see it on the next um, item that we discuss as well that that project is not done as well so I'm going to hand it over to Matt now. Well, we would come back and um, amend the assessment role, but we couldn't get the uh, true assessment role on for the 2019 tax role. So um, in 2020, those taxes would be adjusted some if we had to come back and adjust the assessment role. The other option is, too, if it's a de minimis amount, 500 bucks, the city could just eat the cost. We have options. Anyone else? Okay, we have a motion and second for approval. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. <clears throat> Item number six is 2018 Sewer Improvement Projects Assessment Roll Resolution number 18-44. And this is for the Sanitary Sewer Project in 13th Avenue Southeast in RNZ edition. So I'll look for a motion and second for approval. Moved by Bueller, second by Dan Forth. And I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone here to talk about this? Don't see anyone, so I'll close the public hearing and ask Colin to <coughs> explain it. Thank you, Mayor. This project uh, has been in front of us before uh, as larger discussions, I guess. As you can see um, by the outline, and I don't know if my screen's up actually, but um, in your packets you can see this project is not to extend into the roadway. It's all going to be done within um, the boulevard area. And this is to update their sanitary sewer um, and the lift station in the area to city standards so we can then take this road over. Um, and that's kind of where we're sitting today. This project is also not complete, uh, just for different circumstances um, with uh, materials and equipment not being delivered at this time. Um, I guess that's where we are. Any questions or comments about this one? All right, and I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item seven is the special assessment role for weed cutting. And I'll look for a motion and second for approval. Moved by Councilman Vilhauer, second by Councilman Solem. And I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone here to talk about this? See no one, I will close the public hearing and ask Kristen to explain this. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is just a little bit different than our it's not really a special assessment. This is for the weed cutting that we do throughout the year. Um, these individuals have had the opportunity, they receive bills from the finance office to come in and pay. Um, if we make no contact and they haven't paid by this time, then it, this will be turned over immediately to the county. And they, at that point, will not have the opportunity to come in and pay at the finance office. So these are turned over immediately to the county. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Councilman Danforth. <laughs> Every time this comes before this, this just eats me alive here. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to make, make a comment. Um, Matt, what, Matt or Christian, what do we have in regards to the ability to dictate what these costs are? Do we have full ability to do what those costs are and what we we charge back is that dictated some other manner I don't believe so I think we've set that uh, I'm not sure if it's in our fee resolution or if if it's just a department yeah. 
uh, rate that Rob has set. I don't know if there's any other source that would dictate that cost to us. I'm, and I don't know. I, I see these numbers, and I don't know if that's one cutting or ten cuttings. I don't know that. But we are tolerating and we are enabling people to utilize the city as a supplier in this case. And I am struggling. I, I think, I, I'm sorry, but it's a, it's a pride issue. It's a responsibility issue. It's a, it's a using city resources that could be put someplace else uh, to even deal with these things. And I believe that our, our fees that we charge need to be painful. They, otherwise, if I'm an owner of a property and I'm someplace else and, and I get 50 bucks added here and there, maybe that's about what it costs me anyway. So why not just let the city deal with it? It needs to be painful. You know, I hear time and time and time again that there's things within our city that we need to be aware of and we need to clean up our, our city as landowners and, and property owners. Every one of these becomes an eyesore. Every one of them because of the process that it takes to get it done. And what we're doing is we're, we're taking these people and we're charging them something which is the equivalent of putting them on a naughty chair. And I think it has to hurt. And I, I, I've said this before, and, and every time it comes up every year, it's, it just really is a waste of, of the city's resources to even have to do this. And unless we make it very painful that somebody wants to accept the responsibility that they should have, we're going to continue doing this, and we're going to waste city resources. And... That's my bandwagon. Sorry. Okay. Well, that's that's fine, and and I think the street superintendent does um, explain the rates and ask for your blessing, if not direct approval, every year. Um, Kristen is. I don't know that this is in the fee schedule, though, because it's not a service you can order. No. Um, I do think, though, with the comments that were just made, um, I do think this would be an appropriate time in the next couple meetings if. We want to have that discussion with it because at this point we won't be seen. This is kind of the cutoff point where we won't see any more of the weed cutting, and these will all be given now over to the county. So we kind of start with a clean slate. So I think it would be inappropriate, um, even if we want to discuss it in the next committee meeting and then bring yeah. it, you know, I can put that for the committee and then um, bring it forward for an actual council approval. That's a good idea, and I'm sure that. Whoever does the services is, um, you know, wanting your guidance so that they don't have to be the heavy hand saying this is how much I'm charging. So put that on the next agenda. All right. Any other comments? And I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item number eight is ordinance number 18-21, amending chapter 2.01 regarding allowable locations for special alcohol beverage licenses. And I'm going to ask for a motion and second for approval, and I, there is no public hearing, so we'll just move from there. So I have a motion from Bueller. Is there a second? Second from Thorson. Okay, Matt, you want to tell us about this? Yes, Mayor, thanks. Currently our special event alcohol license ordinance requires that the applicant get a conditional use permit for the property that they're going to be uh, utilizing that special event license uh, whereat they're going to be using that special event license um, what that's caused for the city over the years is there's <coughs> locations that have come forward that want to have special events that uh, the zone that they happen to be in does not allow for a bar tavern in that zone as a conditional use so we've done these things called uh, temporary rezones and then conditional uses and then they come forward for the special event permits just to get us to where we, knew we would like to be and so what this will do is remove that requirement um, it would still require those applicants to come forward and request that special event license um, the council would still um, one of the things that the council would look at is the location so you'd still have the ability to uh, deny an applicant based on a location if we feel if the community feels it's not a proper location for a, for an event but uh, that's the gist of what this ordinance would do thank you I think this is a much better way to handle it than the way we have been 
handling. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? Would there still be opportunity for public input on those types of things then as the council is addressing it? So if there's public concern? Correct, yeah. Okay. Absolutely, everyone. They have been going through kind of a convoluted right. process. Yeah. In fact, yeah, public input or public hearing is required unless the applicant currently owns a license and is applying for a special event at a publicly owned facility. So there's a kind of an exception in there, but. All right, any other questions or comments? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item nine is approval of the 2018 update to the long-term equipment replacement schedule and capital projects plan. So look for a motion, second for approval. Moved by Vilhauer, second by Roby. Kristen, would you describe this for us? It okay. looks different this year. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Um, the next three items, I'll just kind of touch on, they're kind of our final steps for our 2019 um, budget. This would be the long-term capital plan that we discussed the one night. Um, basically, the attached to the agenda and then the book that'll be going out once it's approved onto the website. This will be the long-term capital plan for the city of Watertown. A few of the changes were um, that we did this year is we removed some of the smaller things and we stuck kind of to that $50,000 limit so we could really grasp what the, the big capital items are in our, our projects that we want to kind of get in into the plan for the city. Um, so other than that, this is just the plan that we have. This is not... It's a little bit different than the budget. This plan does not tie us to anything. This is our plan. It doesn't lock us in. If we change it next year, there's, there's nothing that that really affects. So, Except that we should be budgeting that we should, for yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any questions for Chris, Councilman Vilhauer? Chris, I assume I didn't go through and, and cross-match this with our first draft. This incorporates a changes then that we that we acted upon here a couple months ago. That correct? is correct. Everything that came out of the public hearing for the capital, um, the long-term capital plan, is seen now in this book. So, Excellent. Any other comments or questions? All right, then. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item 10 is approval of the Enterprise Fund's budget appropriations for 2019. I'll look for a motion and second. Moved by Councilman Danforth and second by Councilman Roby. This also looks a little different. So, Kristen, you want to tell us about this? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, this is just to kind of finalize the 2019 budgets. Um, this establishes what came out of all the public hearings as far as the enterprise funds. So this covers our sewer, solid waste, and airport funds, um, stating our expected revenues and our anticipated expenses for 2019. Um, currently, I've brought this to you separate. Um, going forward in the next, the next time you see it come around, I think what I'm going to do so you don't see it separate is I will just incorporate it into the ordinance, the big ordinance for the city. So you'll see that in the next year. So... Right, and the reason this wasn't part of the ordinance is because it's not required by law yep. to be part of the ordinance. It doesn't have to be in there, but this is a good thing to do to spell it out. This is what was approved, so I like it. Thank you. This was Kristen's good idea. Anybody have any other comments or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Kristen. Item number 11 is capital outlay accumulations for 2019, resolution number 18-47. I look for a motion and second for approval. <coughs> Moved by Danforth. Second. second by Thorson. Uh, Kristen, you wanna tell us about this? Okay, this is the final one that kind of like I stated, wraps up the 2019. The reason that you see this, the capital outlay accumulation, the resolution for this come kind of after is um, those dollar numbers are kind of based off of what comes out of our long-term capital plan. So this, the numbers that we are, by resolution, setting aside for the capital w was shown on the ordinance for the 2019. Um, we set aside money in the general fund, and we set aside money in the park and rec, as well as the capital improvement fund. So this just basically says, by resolution, we have assigned those dollars. And 
Um, the way we do it is because we want a little bit of flexibility in that, we actually state in the resolution that we can change it each year based off of the movement of our capital, our long-term capital plan. So that's what this does. Right. Thank you. Some communities actually pin it to a specific project, and if we did that, then we're, we're kind of stuck with that. Yep. So this gives us more flexibility. Any comments or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item 12 is authorization for the mayor to sign an agreement with Helms and Associates for a passenger facility charge application. I look for a motion and second for approval. Moved by Bueller. Second by Vilhauer. And we have the airport manager, Todd Sire, here, and um, Mike Schmidt from Helms and Associates to explain this. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is a uh, passenger facility charge. This is a $4.50 tax that goes on to a ticket uh, at the airport. So if you're flying outbound, uh, there'll be an extra $4.50. And I believe it's 11 cents yep. goes to the uh, state, and the rest of it comes to the, uh, to the airport as revenue. Uh, we can take this. The uh, projects that we've done in the past that we've reimbursed the 5%, uh, this essentially collects that money back for the city. So any projects we've done, the runways, taxiways, aprons, uh, buying machinery, anything for the airport that we've spent the 5%, we get that back uh, through this process. And this is also 100% eligible uh, to start with. So we can pay for this up front, and then essentially it's 100% payback the first year. One of the things we'll have to really focus on is you're obviously only in your second full calendar year of employments, and you're already seeing a you know upwards of twenty to thirty percent roughly of growth from last year. So we'll have to really work with the FAA because what you do is you set out a dollar amount that you're looking to grasp from this program or a time frame. So if you say you're going to have all these eligible projects over say five or six years but you have substantial growth each year, you actually might uh, collect that full dollar amount earlier, which then you'd have to go into a, uh, another application. So we'll have to work diligently with the state and uh, the FAA to set a good uh, forecast for your, your future employments. And it's pretty awesome that uh, you're seeing that type of growth and you hit your 10,000th 10, passenger today, so you got your million dollars of entitlements for 2020. So that's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councilman Roby? Oh. Can you give me some idea of what's, what generally happens this compared to other airports? Uh, other airports, uh, commercial airports do this. So, I'm sorry? Uh, we, we haven't put it into effect uh, due to the fact that we only had 2,100 to 5,000 employments or total passengers, I'm sorry. Uh, so cut that in half for employments. Uh, this is only employment based. So it's only outbound passengers we charge this on. Uh, Pier charges it outbound, Aberdeen charges it outbound. Uh, so we're kind of the last one in South Dakota to actually charge this fee, uh, but it didn't make sense in the past with the, uh, the amount of employments we had. But now we're breaking 10,000 numerous years in a row. I think this would be a great revenue stream uh, to pay back some of the debt we have. So with your, your employments, you're looking anywhere, you know, if you're projecting out, this could be uh, fifty-five dollars to $57,000 a year coming back to the city. So it's, it's real money. Absolutely. So, so this fee is collected at the federal level? Is that correct? This is actually collected by the airlines and then remitted back to the city. Correct. Okay, so, so you'll see, yep, the airlines collect this fee. That's why they get an 11, per, or 11 cent um, they keep uh, out of the four dollars and fifty cents. They keep eleven cents. So four dollars and thirty nine cents comes to the to the city. Okay, and then the the fee for doing the application is there an amount? I don't know if I'm missing a page. Yes, you're missing a page. Yeah, we did see that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, there was a page <laughs> okay. missing. Yeah. We noticed that. Um, we visited with the with the feds and uh, the state, and roughly they see anywhere from twenty to thirty five thousand is what it takes to go through this entire application process. Our rate is hourly rate, so if it's less, mm -hmm. that's obviously what the cost is going to be. But it, to give you a really, really tight uh, um, schedule of costs, it's something that, again, like Todd said, air, the uh, city of Watertown has never applied for it. The, the city of Aberdeen did years and years and years ago um, that we weren't involved with. So um, there's, a, there's a few unknowns out there, but... Uh, 
you know, with our invoicing, you're going to see every hour that's worked by every mm -hmm. employee. So um, it won't exceed 35000 Like Todd mentioned, this is 100% eligible. So, you know, if you look at your first year remittance on PFCs, that covers the cost for the application process and then starts reimbursing you for previous city share costs on other projects. So, okay. so is this a one-time application expense that we have, or is this... It's not. So we put a we put a program together. Uh, Helms and Associates Helms and Associates will put a program together uh, for X amount of years. So say we want to go back to 1985. We did a runway project then, and the city share was 35,000. So we'll put that project number one, or maybe the reimbursement number one. Number two would be a taxiway. Uh, however far we string it out, the first go around would be essentially we pay that money back. When we get our projects that we put the first go around, it's, it's about 10 years is roughly what they want to see, yeah. five to 10 years. And once you get those projects paid off, before the deadline of actually getting paid back all of the money, we'll have to submit another application for the fee. And uh, you could but this will this, about this will build the framework for future applications, if that's what you're kind of going with. So it's not something you'd have to see it be... Um, this cost every time you make an application. So we're building the framework for the city, for Todd, for the airport to to uh, um, have it on file. So when, once it comes time to submit another application, that's why I mentioned we have to work with the FAA on on forecasting your employments because you'll have an expiration date or an expiration dollar amount. If you hit the expiration date without collecting those dollars, you can usually, I think, file an extension on that same application, but if you hit the dollar amount, then you have to submit a new application with, a, with another date. So if you, hit the, if you hit the dollar amount first, that means that's good. That means you're beating all of your expectations as far as employments. Um, and, and Aberdeen just, in fact, kind of went through that same process. They were, they were reaching their max of, of funds before their expiration date. So this is going to build your framework for the city to use, whether it's, it's us assisting or whether it's, it's Todd and, and his staff submitting the application in the future. So this will be, when would you think, five to ten years uh, till we have to do it again? Yeah, that's usually the average. Like I said, it just depends on employment. Okay. So we're really going to want to work with, with Todd, the state, and the FA to come up with a, a, a good, comfortable number of yearly employments so we're, we're accurate uh, once we get out that time frame. Because, yeah, we don't want to see it don't in two or it three every years. Other year. Right, that'd right. Kind of a pain. Now, if you do that every other year, that means your employment's really, well, really grew. Well, that's true. <laughs> so that's always a good <laughs> thing, too. But, uh, no, absolutely. You want to, that five to ten, you know, probably right around seven years is, is kind of what they see. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Item 13 is approval to renew life insurance plan with MetLife. I look for a motion and second for approval. Moved by Roby. Second by Y. And I will ask Kristen to explain this. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is before you now is the time where you start to see the renewals of different insurance. Um, this is to um, renew with MetLife for our life insurance policy. Um, we offer this to our employees. Um, we Every employee is covered by the city for a certain amount, so this kind of locks that in. Um, they did show in the renewal to extend it to 2021 at the same rates that you see here. Um, so I guess I will let the council of whoever made the motion, if you want to extend it to not just be 2019, but extend to December 31st of 2021. Um, the city currently pays a dollar 30 a month on an employee. So that's what we're paying for life insurance on an employee. All right, Councilman Roby. In the past, have we done three year extensions or we always done it on an annual basis? To be honest, I don't know if this one has ever really come before you. It's not a contract per se. I mean, it's what we offer to our employees. It doesn't, we don't have to, I suppose, pay it if we didn't want to, but it's it's a renewal. It's what we offer to the employees. It's the rates that they're given. Um, and it, in our benefits package to our employees, we state what we cover, and we cover the 5000 So I think, I don't know if it's ever really come before because it's not, truly a contract but this is who we use for our life insurance so, so we can sort of lock it in yeah I think right? what we're doing is if if you guys 
see that this is a good system, they're saying that they will stick with these rates for an extra two years and not. What's the chance those would go down? I don't know. <laughs> We've used MetLife for quite a while, and t to be honest, I think their rates have pretty much stayed this since I've been here for the same. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Councilman Vilhauer? I want to make sure I understand what I'm looking at. Is this the rate per thousand per month? Is that what we're looking at? That's correct. Okay. So the coverage that the city um, looks at is that basic life. So it's the 22 cents a month per employee. And then we also cover at the next page that the personal, um, I think that's accidental death and disability, that point oh four, we also cover that. So that's where, um, that's where our coverage is on our employees. And then the rest of the rates you would see is if any of the employees want to take out additional based off of their age, that's the rate. And it's per, I should say it's that rate at 1000 and we cover 5000 for employees. So you take the $0.22 cents times 5 and then that's per month. Councilman Roby? What do you recommend? I recommend we stick with this. I think um, I would recommend the three. Um, just because then it kind of lets people know. And like I said, it locks us into knowing that the rates are going to, to be there if there would be a significant change in life insurance. But I'm also fine with doing the 19 if, I mean, I have no problem doing this each year. <coughs> I think it's it's just as easy. We, we get the renewals from all of our other, you'll see our um, health insurance will come up. So this is kind of the time. So I'm fine with just doing it for 2019 and bringing it back each year along with our health insurance. So the letter is recommending three years, right? Well, so the letter just states that it's for the renewal for 2019 with the option to extend it. So oh. I am fine with us just renewing for 19. Okay. And then that way, if there is any changes we want to make in 2020, we... So the motion was for 19. The motion was fine at, yep. 2019. Councilman Danforth. Um, Kristen, how much do we pay annually? What's out of our pockets for in total? For okay. okay. If we had a full staff, 220 employees all year, it'd be around $3,500 total. So, yeah. In total? Yeah. Because it's only, we only are paying $1.30 a month per employee. There's 220 employees. So times 12 yeah, this isn't a large expense for us, um, but it does, it is a benefit to the employees. They do have the opportunity to get um, additional coverage through MetLife. Hardly ever gets used. That's why it's so cheap, right? Yeah. The, the biggest reason why it's, you know, it is used quite a bit, I think, by our employees. The thing is, is the reason these rates are so low is our office, the finance office actually does this. We keep track of it. We keep track of the changes. We keep track of making the payments. We are kind of the administrator. Um, so that's why some of these rates are fairly low compared to some other life insurance policies. By used, I meant. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. People aren't, people aren't dying on a regular basis. <laughs> yes. That's okay. I knew what you meant. All right. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. This was for one year. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item 14 is the first reading of Ordinance 18-22, amending Chapter 7.19 regarding the Home Rule Charter Revision Commission. And there's no action required on the first reading, um, but I'll let Matt talk about it a little bit and... Um, point out that I, um, each council member will be nominating two members to serve on that committee. They can't be an elected official, as I understand. Um, they have to live in the ward of the council person that is nominating them 
I think. They have to be a city registered voter. And um, Matt, you want to take it from there? Uh, yes, Mayor, thanks. Uh, as I recall, we this was a, from a discussion we had at the last committee meeting, uh, the, not tonight, the previous uh, week's committee meeting, uh, regarding our ordinance on the Home Rule Charter Revision Commission and uh, if we need to change anything before we embark on this next, this next year's revision commission. Um, what we took out of that discussion was that the only thing that we would propose to change at this time is that... Uh, we want to make sure that the commission's report can be to us in time to get on the June general election, the municipal general election ballot. And so the proposals you'll see there are just changing the dates, the three dates that uh, the ordinance spells out uh, from February to December. December, the first meeting of December will be the time at which each council member will have to come up with their two recommendations for the commission. The uh, first report of the commission will be due in March and the final report will be due in April and then that would allow like I said that would allow that uh, any revisions that the commission were to suggest to get on the ballot for June okay thank you and so each council person needs to um, present their nominations at the first December meeting and and I will present one so we'll have a total of 21 members is that voted on by the council like can they well, I don't like your nominee kick off somebody it's not my understanding it's There's each no action each it's council just person's announcement. prerogative to pick two two members yeah. right yeah. right councilman Vilhauer uh, mayor Matt I know it's only a first reading but I took the liberty of inviting uh, Jim Roby uh, to the meeting tonight uh, I thought we might have a few questions I know I've got a couple for him Jim chaired the uh, the last go round of this committee back in 2014 so Jim do you want to do you want to step up and Lexa I've got a couple questions I might have a few others from the the, the group up here um, first of all th thanks for taking time out to come come down here tonight Jim um, I guess the, the question that we kicked around at the last meeting and we're discussing like a foregone conclusion uh, and that's a number of, of members on the committee first of all um, there was talk that you know 21 is maybe an unwieldy number to work with you and I visited on the phone and I relayed your the gist of your conversation at our last meeting that you thought it was okay but I guess I'd like to have you talk to address the uh, a little bit your perspective or history with the number of, of, of bodies on that committee my initial impression was and first of all thanks for asking me to uh, appear in front of you it's good to be here not asking for something um, <laughs> but my my initial impression was that I thought that was an awfully large committee but I I think and I, I think Brad will agree with me Brad also served on the Commission um, that once we got rolling it did not prove any problem um, I would my gut feeling is if we got any larger than that it probably would but with the quorum we had which I believe is 11 uh, you know and a few people would miss a meeting but it, it worked out okay and everybody got down to business right away the the time requirements are fairly short relatively speaking but I, I thought the again my initial reaction was 21 is a lot for a committee but I thought it worked out okay Councilman Vilhar. Another question, Jim. Uh, the ordinance calls for at least or, or shall not meet less than four times, and we're pro looks like we're we're probably compressing that time a little bit that the work that the committee has to do their work. I is that a, a, an unreasonable number of times to meet, or I mean, how, how often did your group meet uh, last time around? I th uh, we met six times, and I. Th did everyone receive a copy of the report we I don't know as I shared that okay. um, but uh, yeah we, we met on April 24 April 29 May 6 May 20 May 27 and June 3 and then issued our report is what we did um, and um, you know if you if you're going to get into a, a subject that's got a lot of meat on it and I'll give you an example because it's mentioned in the report there were some 
members that uh, in some discussion in the community, should we consider having a uh, city administrator type position? And, and we concluded there, there was enough time to talk about that with, with this setting. I think you know others could propose things like that later on, but we simply couldn't give that the attention. We did invite in uh, the uh, former city administrator, city manager up in Aberdeen, now the mayor of Aberdeen. Bruce, I think you were at that meeting. Uh, and, no, your brother participated, but I thought you were at that one meeting where the mayor from, came down from Aberdeen. I know you were at one of the meetings. Or, yeah, and, um, and so, you know, that, that's an interesting topic, but we just, that's a big topic, and we didn't have enough time to tackle something like that. So I think the purpose of this commission is to really look at uh, you know, things uh, since the, the, you know, in the prior five years that have gone by, what have we learned that maybe needs to be addressed? And, and uh, they're certainly important, but they're going to be more nuts and bolts about how something's worded and things like that. Councilman Vilhar? Another question, Jim. Um, you and I again visited about this uh, privately over the phone the, uh, probably two, three months ago, actually. We, we had talked as a group here, and in fact, at the last meeting, uh, Mayor, I think you, you were going to put together a little subcommittee of council members uh, to do some homework ahead of time uh, that we would then come up with some recommendations to then hand off to your committee. I mean, is, is that a helpful process, having those of us that, that are you know, probably closest to the action uh, giving some recommendations uh, to, to the, the group? Would that have been helpful uh, when you chaired the, the group? I think if the council has certain concerns, that would be helpful. Um, but you know, the nature of a home rule charter is uh, the, the a community having adopted that is allowed to do anything that's not prohibited in the law, essentially. And so on, um, if you think there's some things that are unwieldy about the charter itself, uh, you know, yeah, your input, although I would, I would assume that the commission uh, would always take input from the city if you wanted certain things looked at. I think that's an appropriate purpose for that. When we did this in 2014, I don't recall that we, Brad, you might have, I don't recall we had any specific directive from the city council to look at any particular issues at that time. And if you look at the report, we ended up saying we don't have any recommendations for change. We thought there were a few things that could be tuned up, but it probably didn't justify a city election. Mayor, can I make a comment? Councilman Hanforth. I'm going back to that, and it didn't seem right to me then, and it's kind of where Glenn is leading to now and some of the discussions that we've had as a council and <clears throat> with the mayor. But at the, the first go-around on the, the Home Real Charter Review, um, and I can speak for myself, I, I was asked to, to identify two individuals that would sit on that, and it was, I'm, I'm going to use the word dictated, that we not participate, that oh. it needed to be purely a public uh, review. And to me, that is very contrary to what the way it should work. We can't dictate, but we certainly need to be a part of the process because these people and these council members and the mayor, we're, we're in that trench. We know what some of our issues that we deal with. And we know that we can't dictate anything, but we certainly should be bringing to light issues that we see and possible solutions. And that, I think, is what our objective is now, is to look at some of these things ahead of time because you don't have a lot of time. And, and to present, here's our thoughts, what we feel the issues are, here's what we think some of the solution possibilities are, go at it. And in that manner, I would hope that's beneficial to that, that committee. Yeah, I wasn't aware that... Um that command had come down on high like that. Um, I think that in the meetings, my recollection is that uh, a couple of council members stopped by, um, and my recollection is, is when we invited in the speaker, it was that Mike Levson, uh, the mayor up in Aberdeen, came in and talked. That was kind of an interesting meeting. Um, and I, I would guess that, uh, again, Brad, you might have a comment on this. I don't think our commission would have resisted input like that but would you have asked questions had they been there did that come up where you wondered 
You know, I think we felt free that if, if we had questions about something, we were going to ask them. And, for example, when we talked just generally about the subject of, of a city manager type, city administrator type position, you know, we reached out to the city managers in a couple of towns, and, and then we invited some to see if they could come up and talk to us. So I think the commission felt it had that authority to do that. Um, I don't recall any particular issues that we were aware of that deeply impacted the city, but I, if there were some, I would have been interested myself in wanting to probably hear from council members, and we would have called them up, I think, and asked them to come. Well, and we certainly wouldn't want the commission members to feel pressured in any way um, if the presence of the council and the mayor is making someone feel like they can't freely communicate that's that's not a good sign about our community but uh, we, we don't want them to feel that way we, we want them to feel um, welcome to ask questions and if there's a good reason for the council and mayor not to come I would like to hear it and explore that. Otherwise, it seems like you'd want them there. Yeah. I don't think anybody from the commission said that. No, I'm not saying that. And I think the mayor hit it on the head. I, I, I don't, that was our first time around on mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. I, I am pretty confident that the, in, the intent of that, the fact that you didn't have anybody there probably tells me that there was that sense of don't get in, involved. Or, or interfere with, and I think it becomes the int intimidation factor. And I, um, you know, I, having sat on, like, for example, the, the Board of Adjustments and the, the Plan Commission, when council members came, there was always that little bit of a intimidation factor that, that went along with that. And that's probably where that went with. But um, I think what we're doing this year, what we're planning to do some of the work, I think will be very beneficial, and it's up to the committee to decide whether it's relevant or not. But I think you're going to get you, whoever these people are, are going to get a good insight from those elected officials and, and probably some of that coming from staff as well, input as to what we see the issues are and why certain changes maybe do occur or don't occur. Uh, I would hope that's the case. And uh, I'm, I look forward to us putting that together for this committee. I really do. I think it would be very beneficial. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Questions for Jim? Actually, not a question for Jim. I guess I, I've got a question uh, not involved the last go round. When that report of the commission or the committee comes to us as a council, we don't take any kind of action. I mean, that all we just do is receive it, and then it goes uh, goes to a public vote, correct? Yes, that's correct. If there's changes that are proposed, then it would go to the public vote. Right. Anything else? Well, the, the subcommittee is formed, so we'll be rolling sleeves up and getting to work right away. Thank you, Jim. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you. Item number 15 is consideration of change order number two final for the miscellaneous storm and street improvements project number 1718 with J&J &J Earthworks, Inc. for an increase of $400 bringing the total contract amount to $182,036. Um, and this received the recommendation of the council previously. But Colin, would you please just give a little refresher, and then I'll get a motion and second for approval. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this change order completes a project that actually started last year. They had one item to complete that is finally complete, and we are in the process of closing that project out and this is part of that what was the one item for four hundred dollars um, they had to install a head wall on this project uh, and that kind of got pushed off due to what late weather last year lots of wet weather yep and uh, that's there was a four hundred dollar increase okay I'll look for a motion and second for approval Moved by Solom, second by Danforth. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item 16 is consideration of change order number five, final, 
for the Sanitary Sewer Improvements Project Number 1808 with Dunnock Inc. for an increase of $3,416, bringing the total contract amount to $523,625.41. And this received the recommendation of the committee prior. Um, I'll, I'll look for a motion and a second for approval. So moved. moved by Y. Second by Thorson. Any, um, well, Colin. Thank you again, Mayor. Uh, this this completes, or this will be the final change order, and uh, this has been substantially complete for our sanitary sewer improvements project for this year. Uh, we did run into a lot of issues. Uh, this takes into account those added costs, which ended up being a lot, and to offset those costs a little bit, uh, we did remove a portion of the project, um, an overlay of two streets, that will be done uh, in the near future um, coming up. But that was to save on cost this year, so uh, it ended up with a final increase of you know this small thirty four hundred dollars, and uh, we're pretty satisfied with uh, how little we had to increase it based on the amount of work that was done. Okay, any questions or comments? All right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item 17 is authorization for the mayor to sign the amendment to the Prairie View Edition Development Agreement. I look for a motion and second for approval. Moved by Vilhauer, second by Bueller. And this received the um, blessing of the committee meeting prior, but um, Matt, would you please just review what's being proposed? Sure, Mayor, thank you. Um, this is an addendum to a 2013 development agreement between the City of Watertown and Midwest, Bin Midwest Business Condos uh, for the development of Prairie View Edition in Northeast Watertown. Uh, this does basically two substantive things to the original development agreement. Uh, first, it uh, basically ref will reflect the, uh, the payment the city has already made uh, for sanitary sewer services in Cherry Drive, 27th Street East, and 14th Avenue North. Uh, and the second substantive change that we'll make to the original agreement will uh, basically it'll bind the city to make uh, reimbursement to the developer for one third of the cost for installation of storm sewer in Cherry Drive. Thank you. So are there any questions? See none, I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item 18 is old business, and we have the update on the airport terminal grant application here. So we have Mitch from Mead and Hunt, and sorry, Mitch, can't remember your last name. <laughs> Todd will tell us maybe while you're hooking up. I am uh, Mitchell Walker with Mead and Hunt. Oh, okay. Thank so, you. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> First off, thank you. Uh, Thank you to the council. Thank you to the mayor for uh, letting me speak this evening. I uh, wanted to give an update on where we are at in the uh, terminal concept budget report uh, and moving forward for uh, a potential terminal design in the near future. Uh, first off, I just wanted to highlight this. And employment numbers came out from the FAA uh, just earlier this month. And as you can see, uh, Watertown, the number I, I like to look at there is that is that 427% increase year over year from um, 16 into 17. What we're seeing now, uh, as Mike had referenced earlier, is probably about 10 to 20% increase uh, overall. So just kudos uh, to the work the airport's doing and to the city of Watertown here. It's really exciting time. <clears throat> Um, again, as an introduction, I'm Mitchell Walker uh, with Mead and Hunt, uh, doing uh, some project management design architect for our, out of our Minneapolis office. As a backstory, I was actually born in Watertown, so this is uh, really exciting for me. 
um, grew up in Madison, South Dakota, just uh, an hour south. I uh, had uncles who went to uh, Lake Area and two of my cousins as well. So again, really exciting for me to be a part of this process and uh, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, our teaming partners are Helms and Associates who have been doing uh, work out at the airport for, for years. I don't know, Mike, if you have the, the number offhand. Uh, and then Co-op Architects, who also uh, is a local architect here in Watertown as well. I have an office here uh, downtown. Uh, I wanted to get into the process of what we are doing currently. Uh, now, this is an ongoing process here. Um, we are developing a concept budget report to be used for uh, basically the initial phase of a design for a new terminal building for Watertown. As a part of that process, step one is seeking supplemental appropriations dollars. Uh, the federal government this year had, had put forth a, an additional $1 billion of supplemental appropriations into the airport improvement program. Uh, applications uh, for year 2019 are due at the end of October. And so what we are doing is trying to um, set ourselves up and set Watertown up to, to ask to seek uh, money associated with that supplemental appropriations and then complete the concept and budget report. Uh, and if we, are, uh, if we end up getting that, uh, those dollars from the FAA, uh, then we will parlay that right into design. Um, if we are not so fortunate, uh, then this concept budget report acts as a document that, that, again, is the first step in terminal design, which, Todd, you can speak to this. Is that 2020? Uh, 2021 and 2022, we have it in the CIP already. So this document, you know, the worst case scenario is, is we don't get this um, supplemental appropriations money, but you are, we are set up for design uh, for 2021-22 20, uh, as well. And that first step is, is what is always going to be required from the federal, uh, from the FAA. So, uh, and please, this is a, I'd love this to be informal as it can be. So, um, Mayor, if, if there are any questions from the commission or committee members, please, or the council members, please uh, just feel free to jump in. <clears throat> um, just a quick, what I'm going to be talking about, uh, our process and what's going to help us seek that application money is we're gonna, going to be looking at forecasting. That's uh, air, uh, employment forecasting, commercial service and charter service. Uh, then we will be looking at program allocation or space allocation. Uh, we'll basically identify what spaces will go into this terminal uh, and then using standard uh, metrics, um, you know, based on the FAA's advisory circles or, or circulars or uh, IATA standards, that's international aviation, transportation, et cetera. Uh, all those acronym speaks, um, uh, we get uh, those act as, as standards in, in uh, the practice. Uh, and then we will briefly discuss a couple of alternatives that we have, uh, mostly as it relates to site location um, this evening. Uh, so we, we are tasked with doing two alternatives. Um, one is uh, site location kind of adjacent to the existing terminal building, and one is, is in a uh, potential new location on the airfield which has some definite advantages and, and some disadvantages, as you'll see. So um, moving on, I'll just kind of zoom through some of these, uh, some of these quick slides. Uh, right now, your distance to your hubs is uh, Denver and MSP, and then drive times to Fargo, Minneapolis, and Sioux Falls. It's kind of where you're situated um, right there. It's, it's a great spot. Now, Mead and Hunt has actually uh, been doing the air service consulting for, uh, for Watertown uh, for the past few years. Um, and we actually developed, as a part of that, a catchment area. Right now, this is what we anticipate seeing as, as your guys' peak catchment and how, uh, where the travelers will travel from to get to Watertown to fly out to Denver or to, to Pier. Uh, I just wanted to make note of the uh, amount and number of large businesses that are in Watertown um, and note that that air travel is, is uh, incredibly important to the business community. And now the uh, current flight schedule as it stands today, right now we have Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, uh, flights with uh, two, uh, two round trip routes. Uh, and then on Wednesday and Saturday, there is uh, one flight uh, each one of those days. 
Now, what we've been talking about here as we get into the forecast is r right now there's always that stop in pier. And so if, if we're looking at flights to Denver, um, you're actually competing with Piers community as well for those seats on that aircraft. Um, right now, though, uh, as, as is shown by today's 10,000th enplanement, um, you know, Watertown is really taking advantage of this airline. That's wonderful. So our current forecast uh, actually needs a little bit of amending right now, just based on, on how, uh, how great uh, the, the airport has been operating currently. Uh, but CPA has uh, commercial service passengers. SDSU has already some charter contract. Uh, in, the, in the very recent history, there were some uh, casino flat charters down to uh, Laughlin and uh, through Sun Country. And um, again, Todd can speak to this a little bit more, but we're hoping to work towards an interline agreement uh, to connect CPA with uh, United Airlines. And what that would allow you to do is, is for anyone in and around Watertown to be able to hop online and say, I want to go from Watertown to Seattle, as opposed to right now saying, I want to go from Watertown to Denver, Denver to Seattle. Um, so as you can see right now, our enplanement totals, as I had mentioned before, were 11,160. Uh, right now, this, this forecast is relatively flat, um, and, and we see that kind of based on the existing routes that you guys have currently. Now, you're already probably blowing this, this forecast out because you're probably going to hit this 2022 number or even surpass it um, this year. So the, the, incredible, the impressive growth that is Watertown is, uh, needs to be reflected in an updated forecast. What, we, what we're um, trying to reconcile is this, um, the, the FAA will not fund based on, well, this is what we think is going to happen. This is, they, you, they need some more um, hard data, uh, some more routes. You can't just say, well, we're going to get this and it's going to happen and, you know, and, and go from there. Now we can we can back up these numbers um, with a potential interline agreement, and and that's where we feel like, or even the direct routes where we're not competing with Peer anymore, and uh, and we could see these numbers increase significantly. So um, I know we are going to make a pass again at the forecasted numbers. Um, these numbers won't necessarily affect what our program is, our space program. That space program is, is based on what's called a peak hour and planed passenger. So that is uh, for your peak hour for, it might be in the morning or, or in the afternoon, whichever flight I guess is, is going out, that is the peak hour of this airport. And we have to, as designers, design a terminal that, that works well within that peak hour time frame. So uh, that's a long way of saying, you know, the forecasted numbers, if that skews up a couple of thousand people, it actually probably won't affect your peak hour number, um, which is what we're taking our, our uh, program from. Any questions on forecast uh, before I move forward? Or Todd, did I miss anything? Please, uh, uh, all right, on a roll. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> the, uh, the next item I'd like to talk about is then our space programming. Um, right now, we're seeing significant need uh, for space for area in the post-secure area. Now, that's everything from the TSA checkpoint and beyond. Um, right now, we have, we have one lane uh, that is really tight. Uh, you're dealing with some, uh, some constraints in the building that, that require you to actually um, screen passengers like in the um, in the unisex toilet room, which is not ideal for anyone that needs additional screening. Um, so we don't actually have a set area for that. That's one very basic item that uh, we would obviously need to address. Uh, and then just the overall hold room space, the space where the passengers congregate after the checkpoint is, uh, is not adequate to, to serve what you guys ha even have currently uh, on a busy day and what we would see uh, in the future as well. Um, <clears throat> number of gates, what we would like to see is probably one boarding bridge out of this, uh, one jetway they're typically called, but a passenger boarding bridge uh, would be, uh, we would definitely want to have that capability, and then possibly one ground boarding gate for large charters, or, uh, or, or one of these SDSU charters, or a casino charter, or anything um, like that. 
Uh, restrooms need uh, obvious expansion. And then the, the big item here would be uh, concessions or vending. Um, the airport doesn't currently have a airport restaurant. And that's not uncommon. Um, but what is incredibly uh, unique about this is that you have probably over a thousand people right in that technology, um, or sorry, the industrial park, uh, just basically on airport property. And if we, uh, if we develop a, an airport um, restaurant, what that does is it gives Todd and the airport staff additional non-aeronautical revenue, which is, uh, which is what we are we're always trying to give them more ways to, to make and, uh, and maintain then their uh, airports. The next slide is, um, is the pre-secure, it should say, uh, pre-secure area. Um, again, just kind of overall, uh, it needs to be beefed up a little bit, um, not necessarily as much as the post-secure. Um, what we'd be looking at is currently right now there are no baggage claim devices. There are really no devices. It's, it's all by uh, muscle and a baggage slide, basically. Um, so we'd like to uh, alleviate the airport operators and TSA, uh, make that easier on them. Uh, waiting areas, public restrooms, all of these need to be addressed. Um, the non-public areas are highlighted because they're not eligible for federal funding, um, but they, they need to be a part of the project. So those are areas when we get into actual design, we'll have those, uh, those meetings with those stakeholders, specifically to TSA, to, to our airline partners, and uh, to potential uh, rental car uh, is something that we would be uh, looking to add in the terminal building and obviously the uh, concessionaire as well. Uh, just the last item to note here, your current terminal facility, including admin, is at 10,000 square feet. Um, we feel very comfortable in saying that you'd be justified probably all the way up to, probably up to the 28, 29,000 uh, square foot area. Um, uh, right now we'd probably feel most comfortable just uh, in that 20 to 25 uh, region. <clears throat> Councilman Vilhauer has a question. Mitchell, how, how does that compare to, to Pier Aberdeen as far as uh, space, you know? So uh, Pier I only know on, on outline, unfortunately. It, it appears uh, about 17.5 in their footprint. 17,500 square feet in their footprint, but uh, that is a two-story facility. Uh, not all of that space in the second level is occupied. I know they have some two-story atrium spaces, but uh, I, I would guess we would probably be in that 30,000, uh, a shade over 30,000 potentially for, uh, for Pier and uh, Aberdeen. I, I'm not, uh, I don't know offhand. Uh, yeah, maybe Mike knows offhand. He's a flat work guy. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I can speak a little bit to Aberdeen. I've been up there and toured the facility uh, for this project, actually. And uh, they do have two gates there in Aberdeen, uh, with one being a jet, jet bridge and uh, the other one being for charter, uh, similar to where this, this one's being set up. Uh, they are all on one level as well, so uh, they're a little more spread out. I would say uh, it's a, a, a pretty identical match to Aberdeen is what we're looking at. Any other questions on space? All right, I'll open this up then to alternatives where I know we'll have some discussion here. Um, uh, what we are seeing, uh, we, we had a meeting with the airport board this afternoon, um, and what we had been tasked with, as I had mentioned, were two uh, alternatives, um, basically site locations. Um, one is to uh, kind of rebuild adjacent to the current terminal. What that does for us is allows us to utilize the existing infrastructure, um, the parking, the sanitary sewer, uh, water, electric, everything is all coming out to that terminal currently. Um, so it would be pretty easy to kind of build in that general vicinity. Um, the, the, the downside of that current area is exactly you know, what made it so advantageous to the restaurant <laughs> is it is kind of nestled in that uh, industrial park. And it's actually um, kind of set between the FBO and, and uh, quite a few tea hangers. So w go ahead, Todd. Sorry. But. Uh, FBO is the fixed-based operator for the private sector. I'll try not to use Sorry. acronyms. I always do it. Um, that, that, 
basically general aviation. Uh, your private pilots, your business pilots are, are all uh, within that fixed base operator or the hangars associated with it on the other side. Um, the entry drive then means that you're sharing that entry drive, which is two-lane traffic, with, uh, uh, I, I've been behind, uh, uh, just recently coming out here, been behind a semi in there, um, uh, going to the industrial park, and then, and then uh, just traffic associated with uh, which each, each one of those facilities. So ideally, it would be nice to, to separate um, your commercial service passengers with your general aviation pilots and then your uh, industrial park uh, businesses as a whole. The FAA would like to see that. Um, I know on the, on the ALPs, they'd like to separate out um, and segregate that traffic. Um, you know, and I can get into the cons then. What, what that does is it means that you don't get the, uh, the use of all those existing infrastructures. You would actually be building new if we relocated that terminal building uh, to uh, substantially more costs associated with it. Um, but budget numbers, these are very preliminary. Uh, building would be plus or minus $8 million with site civil uh, being about $1.5 million. That would include a bridge and uh, some baggage equipment as well. Um, Site option two, and I'll pull up a, a airport map so you guys can see this, but site option two would be built uh, adjacent to Taxi Lane Bravo. Um, some of those pros are exactly what we've been dis discussing. It creates a designated entry, an apron for commercial service. Right now what is happening is there's actually a box that, that um, Todd and the airport staff have, have actually painted on to designate uh, which area in the current apron is for commercial service and what is for general aviation. Uh, it allows for greater expandability, um, but, and this is the, probably the biggest con, and we talked about the, uh, we talked with the state um, after our, our airport board meeting to kind of let them know uh, these are the two uh, ways we're going. Uh, we were actually mostly looking at um, if they would consider funding uh, site and civil separate to the building. Uh, so they would participate as a whole in the in the overall cost, and then we mentioned the um, what is an EA environmental assessment uh, because we would be potentially proposing to build new uh, that that would likely in all likelihood require an environmental assessment, which that alone would take probably about a year to complete, and then obviously would uh, would jeopardize at least this year's uh, opportunity for uh, supplemental dollars. Uh, we wouldn't need that in the uh, built adjacent to the existing terminal because um, it's already disturbed. Um, it would probably go through what's called a categorical exclusion or CADEX, and uh, we see no issue with that being accepted. Um, questions on this? Uh, again, budget numbers, we could see that that uh, building adjacent to Taxi Lane Bravo probably coming in about double uh, to what to what the other proposal would be. And here I'm just going to kind of zoom in on, on where we were talking about. So this is the ALP. This is the airport layout plan. Um, this is the current, current terminal building as it sits. Uh, what the green highlighted area that I've done here is, is probably roughly about a 20 to 25,000 square foot, just a block rectangle um, sitting right on uh, uh, a portion of the uh, terminal site. One item to note here, and, and it came up in discussion with, uh, uh, with the airport board this afternoon, uh, you know, if, if we do look at this as the, the preferred alternative and, and choose to go down this path of building adjacent to the terminal building, you know, it's pretty, we, we run into this problem a lot where we're, we have shared aprons or, or um, facilities coming in uh, too close to one another. And I would say that the easier, the easier uh, buildings to move would be the general aviation buildings um, as opposed to uh, building new. This is the option uh, just as a just as kind of a l large oversized block on where we would potentially be looking at building um, an apron, uh, additional taxi lane, entry drive parking in the terminal building for building in a new location and uh, uh, you know, I can I can understand absolutely why 
uh, why we would want to look at each option because they do represent uh, uh, you know really good pros uh, and then each one of them has some drawbacks there's there's no no doubt about it question commissioner your previous slide showed about I think it was eight and a half or nine for the uh, yeah it was nine and a half and he got 16 what's the split on that uh, the split for what city pays federal funds pay <clears throat> sure so the building what we are going through this process right now with our program uh, the building would probably be 75 to 80 percent eligible overall now that's eligible for federal funding um, then the state has their involvement currently capped at two hundred thousand dollars for uh, for a terminal building as a as it stands alone and uh, and so then the rest would be on the sponsor there in that uh, particular instance um, so doing the math uh, 80 of 8 and and then subtracted the state uh, amount at 200,000 the site civil however would be fully eligible um, nearly all of the site civil would be eligible at 90 10 uh, sorry 95 5 and the state would consider that separate uh, to the overall piece which would mean um, the state would pay potentially uh, sorry uh, state would pay five percent of the eight million dollars and uh, and then the city would pay five percent of the eight million dollars as well would they pay just five percent of the 1.5 on if we stayed in the same site uh, yes yeah they would oh sorry Oh, I'm sorry about that. Then yes, yes. So, so the state would pay five percent of the one point five. It's a ninety-five-five state, so ninety percent fed, five percent state, five percent local. And uh, so, with any of the site civil costs, those would come in at a hundred percent eligible or ninety percent federal, five percent state, five percent local. It'd be the same as our other programs that we have: the ninety-five and five. So for the this, site work, the building would be the uh, seventy to eighty-five percent eligible. Yep, the building's kind of the the outlier here. So the the only difference would be that it's a massively larger number that we'd pay five percent of on the civil work if we went to a completely new site. That's correct. I have a question, Mayor, if I might. Um, the environmental assess the assessment you talked about earlier. Um, would that be eligible as well as the jet bridge for federal funds for those items and just kind of what ballpark cost for a jet bridge in the, in the environmental assessment if we did that so go ahead Todd, please uh, we checked on the jet bridge price today actually and it was uh, just just over 800,000 in planning numbers you can basically as assume about a million dollars for a bridge and an EA I don't have those numbers offhand um, do you know what an EA would run, Mike? It all depends on, on the project. Here in a confined area, it's kind of a confined spot. So if you're really looking at versus a, uh, a bridge that's going to be used for multi-passage and flex EA, it's hard to say. The biggest thing with EAs is sometimes you need the money to design it. It's the time. The two-year process, so the time you get it from the <coughs> I think you had mentioned it was a year. Uh, one year minimum. I, I, you know, we CEAs that come two years uh, as well. But you know, the, the the point of that as well is that uh, again, if 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 uh, somehow we don't end up getting the supplemental dollars, um, and and we are kind of at the timeline of the CIP, then then you would have time to go through an EA and be ready to go at a new location um, uh, in that 2021 time frame. But the EA is eligible for federal funding as well. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I have a question. A couple of them. Councilman Danforth. Um, well, a couple things. We've, we've talked significant dollar differences between a new location versus staying in the same location. Does that help us or hurt us in an application uh, to be <clears throat> one way or the other to, to, as far as succeeding with that? That's one question. The fact that we're a uh, essential air service airport 
does that help us or hurt us in this with the supplemental appropriations that are taking place? Uh, because it seems like every X number of years, somebody out in Washington says we got to get rid of it. Right. So that's one of my other questions. And then uh, thirdly is is I got like nine things. I'm yeah. No, there. please. No. The, but the third thing is is the define for us a little bit what that environmental assessment really is. I mean that that it. I mean. What's really taking place when they do that? Are they like studying the effect on the birds? Are they what are they doing? Yeah, seriously. Uh, little... Yeah, they would be doing um, uh, wetland overviews. They would be doing hazardous uh, sites. Uh, our I guess our initial concern was that that site was a previous um, uh, military armory or base, um, and so. Soils would definitely be a concern if there was any lead contamination, uh, contamination of so soils. Uh, migratory patterns, wetlands your biggest one, but migratory pa patterns. Uh, tribal, um, I'm missing, I'm certain. Uh, uh, There's like 23 different categories. Archaeological, yeah. So that just requires a lot of actually like uh, sending out notifications and then waiting 30 days as well, or waiting, you know, 60 days for comment. Um, and so, and then just doing the, the testing as a whole. Um, so that's the EA. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll review it. Now, the, is it, does it help us or not help us or no effect if we're essential air service? Uh, at this point, and, and I could let Todd speak to this a little bit, but, uh, you know, EAS does not, does not absolutely disqualify you for seeking supplemental. It doesn't help or hurt you. Um, right now, priority airports are, are looked at based on this <laughs> micro or macro uh, uh, politan, macro, mi micropolitan. Micropolitan. And, uh, um, but Watertown has, uh, has been kind of singled out, I wouldn't necessarily say, but, but definitely flagged by uh, the state and by uh, our program manager in Bismarck as being a, a really great opportunity to seek this funding. In fact, um, you know, Todd had told me that, that the day that this came out, they had called one another and said, you know, what airports are we thinking? And the first one they both said was Watertown to try to push this terminal. So my, my next and last question on that long list was the, if we go to the, the eight or nine million dollar solution versus the sixteen dollar or eighteen million dollars does that really have an effect? Do they look more favorably on the lesser number, or do they look for the end result, and that's what their primary goal is? Uh, we were looking at this today. Um, right now, I know that they would say no. Um, I know that there is a project that that got funded at about twenty five million dollars uh, just in the in the first uh, wave of, of grant funding and some other terminals actually sought about eleven million dollars in funding uh, as well so um, no i don 't think that that the the budget amount would disqualify you I think what what would potentially hurt your chances for supplemental at this point would be asking for Site two, because of the environmental assessment. Now, what supplemental the supplemental grant would ask you to do is start work immediately within six months. So we would be starting the design process right away, and, and um, again parlay that into uh, construction uh, probably next fall. If we got awarded. If if we were awarded. Uh, this also uh, a piece that got brought up in the airport board was. Uh, we have a $4 million apron project that's going to happen this next year and the year after. Uh, currently, we have it phased. Uh, that may get thrown into one project, uh, depending on how this all shakes out. Uh, but one thing to note, uh, for Site 2, uh, the airport board uh, stated that if we don't do the $4 million currently where we're at, uh, we could potentially use that $4 million to offset some costs for the new apron at a site other than where it's at currently. I have a mayor. Go ahead. Uh, another question. <clears throat> I hate to belabor this. No, uh, please. Environmental ass assessment. But uh, if they did, uh, you know, if there was a, if they did uncover some bad soils, uh, who knows, you know, burial ground, whatever it is. But 
would we would the cost would burden be on the city to take care of that or again would the federal government be involved with that i mean because that could open up a can of worms too i, I don't know what the odds are of that happening but it's something to consider <clears throat> In terms of hazardous mitigation, typically the FAA finds that ineligible and, uh, and the cost would be borne on local or state. Um, uh, what, what the FAA uh, would also do as a part of this process is ask for alternative sites and our alternative site would basically be site option number one. So we may go through this whole thing a year or maybe two and they come back and say, build it on the right side of the terminal currently but where it's at just for just if they did uncover say they did have soils that <clears> had <throat> uh, petroleum product whatever in it would we then would it be incumbent upon us to make that right if they uncovered that in that process yes so the application has to have a site chosen the application actually does not even have to have a site oh. or an, an alternative chosen um, the site needs to have a dollar amount, a description um, and a dollar amount and why you feel that this is uh, uh, justified. Um, we would, we would want to back up and what we've done to this, to this standpoint has been trying to back up whatever number that comes out to if it's, uh, and we would likely want to shoot high on this regardless. Um, if it's the nine and a half million we've already talked, we'd probably go ahead and ask for that 10 to 10 and a half million because uh, truly this is a one-time deal. There's no amendments to a, uh, a supplemental grant. So if you run into unforeseen conditions or anything like that, then, then that would all be borne by the state or local as well. But, um, but in, in terms of selecting a site, no, that is not necessary at this point. Uh, I, th I think it would be what they may find fault in uh, would be asking for the full potentially 16 to 18 million dollars for option two when we know we have to have an EA done and then and then saying that we would then go back to option one with that I I think that may raise some flags I think if we ask for the 16 million dollars for option two I, I I think the environmental assessment is gonna uh, flag us out of that one um, and, and then the $16 million, I feel like, would just be too much for uh, what we would be proposing as justifiable space in site option one. I, I really want to lay this out and, and, you know, give you guys the options here, too. I mean, I, I, I want you to know that it's not off the table to choose option two uh, if, uh, if we don't get the supplemental grant. Or if you, don't, if you just want to go after Site 2 and, and don't want to go after the supplemental grant for Site 1, I, I do feel that, that the time frame of an EA requirement would uh, preclude uh, the FAA from giving us grant funds in this year for, for supplemental. Councilman Danforth. Doesn't it somewhat come down to what the cost benefit of going to <coughs> the alternate site versus staying with the existing site and, and <clears throat> dealing with that? I mean, if you're going to double the cost of the project, basically, mm -hmm. yep. there has to be a reason and a benefit to do that. That's very significant. So well, is that analysis going to take place that says, here's, to, to you, City of Art Town, here's why, here's your justification for doing that. Yeah. And it's got to be quality of service or it's got to be something. Right. And I think the, the airport board um, definitely um, uh, stated this case as well as is, is you all, e even me, uh, will probably get one shot at this, right? And so if it's in the wrong spot currently, uh, then, then we have to live with it for the next 50 years. Um, and so in that regard, that is your cost benefit to putting this thing in away from uh, uh, your industrial park, allowing expansion of that industrial park and expansion of the general aviation area in its current location and just completely isolating out the passenger service just for safety and security. Um, for overall costs, I can't say that, that isolating the passenger terminal will draw airlines or will uh, give any more money to non-aeronautical revenue or, or, or any additional funds to the airport. 
I think it would actually cut revenue uh, due to the fact of the restaurant. I mean, if we move it, there's no sense in having a restaurant if we move it up to the northeast uh, of the airport. So uh, factors like that. Does Aberdeen still have a restaurant in the in their airport? It's been a while. They, they shut that. Yeah. Well, because we had one in the 80s, I recall. I, yeah. They went across the road in Aberdeen. Would you mind showing that airport improvement plan again yeah. and, and show where the site for – and you show us which way is north. So north is actually um, – <laughs> north is actually right off of 1735, isn't it? Yes. So north is to the left on this um, document. And you're coming in on Highway 20. Can you see my mouse, yeah. actually? Okay. And and this is the entrance into the existing airport road. Um, right now, this is all two-lane traffic, which, uh, regardless, we feel like we would want to make that change if it stays or if it goes, um, creating a, a one way roundabout in here uh, as a as right now at this location having having two lane traffic going to one single road of two lane traffic seems uh, um, a little bit a little bit dangerous um, so this is the current location um, future expandability would probably be expanded um, to the east and taking over FBO area um, the current or the, the proposed site alternative two would probably create a new uh, cut to Highway 20. Um, we would we would likely need to bypass. There's a uh, thing called a runway protection protection zone where we basically can't build anything um, right off the end of the runway. So we'd likely need to cut this or 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 even even use that same entry uh, uh, vehicular entrance and then uh, come off to the side. Um, to that uh, existing chain link fence, uh, perimeter fence, and then around into the terminal area and out, uh, creating a loop road. Okay, so that other green. S sorry, these were That's things that we were talking about. Um, just uh, we feel like going anywhere outside uh, uh, east of of 1735 was going to be. Uh, too close to the community one for all that additional traffic and would add uh, actually even more costs than we're proposing in uh, uh, in this site option too. Yeah, because there's no roads out there that are worthy. Yeah, and then it, it actually would probably deal more with, y you would need to create a full length uh, taxi lane, parallel taxi lane to the uh, uh, runway as well, which would be a, a sizable project. And that would also give us longer term costs that we have to deal with in maintaining that. Yeah, well, that's true. Right? Yep. I, would, I would ask that you not use the term roundabout in the future. <laughs> I would, it's kind of been a sore subject at times, but no, I'm just joking. But um, how would, it's if the we stayed the Mike the same, Danforth roundabout. <laughs> yeah, no, let's not do that one, but not unless I'm buried in the middle. But uh, if we were to build on the current site, how how would you envision that? Does the existing one stay and we have a structure that's built and then we tear it down or do you incorporate the existing one? How would that process work? <clears throat> so that is uh, being discussed currently. When we, get, uh, when we get into the meat of the alternatives process, we'll, we'll uh, definitely be looking at ways that we can either save potentially an area of the new part or, or you know, build on, on the most recent uh, uh, airport manager's area or the administration area, and then uh, build further out to the east off of that. Um, uh, there are options to, you know, use a portion of the footprint and build out from that or, or ways that we would just build new off to the side uh, adjacent to it, and then that facility would remain. Um, currently, right now, you have all these FAA uh, antenna within the current terminal, and those, if we can somehow house those as they stand, that would be, that would be great. Uh, otherwise, those are significant costs to remove at the cost of not the FAA, whose antennas they are, but of the sponsor. Uh, Where are they? Can you show on the map? Yeah. <coughs> They're actually within the terminal building. I think it's a, it's a RCO. 
stand for anyway. Yep. All right. They're they're just right in this end right here. So potentially, you know, we could look at trying to salvage that wing building off of that and and then demoing what was unneeded prior. Um, uh, Mayor, we've not gotten into the alternatives. Uh, again, this is more kind of site layout and, and programming. Um, we just wanted to, we wouldn't have even brought this up uh, in the alternatives unless we, uh, if there wasn't such a discrepancy in dollars and, and the EA overall, um, which is the only reason why we're bringing this up right now. So this is a, a pretty fast um, track to get this all wrapped up, basically two weeks, and we don't have another council meeting scheduled uh, before the application is due to be turned in. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you anticipate for completing it and, and <clears throat> what kind of turnaround? So uh, the airport board today had actually asked and directed uh, uh, us to to kind of finalize that that number that ask for each alternative and provide that to the airport board uh, where we would have a, uh, a conference call to discuss next week Tuesday um, and and then potentially then at, at that point you know they would be able to review it uh, allow uh, or provide recommendations to the council but ultimately uh, what we would be looking for is is uh, um, uh, who is the would we want we would probably want the mayor to sign the application actually as right. well. Right, I'm so. authorized to sign the the packet. And I would want to hear from the airport board what their recommendation is, and, and if they Certainly. meet, that would be good. And I, I don't know how the council feels about um, sending it in one way or the other without another discussion. But the council could all be present at the you know or participating in the conference call where that decision is made and I mean we we publicize those meetings anyway so mm -hmm. they're, yep. they're public meetings but they can't act right right nope only providing recommendation yep mm -hmm. I, I understand and uh, I think you know what we want to do is just to get that number um, solidified and and what um, you know if any additional uh, issues arise with site option two versus uh, site option one, then we would want to know that. Councilman. Councilman Roby. The two FAA people you talked about that both said, hey, if Watertown came first to mind, what role do they play between now when we make a decision? In other words, will they make a recommendation? <clears throat> I think it helps to have your program managers get behind you. Um, uh, right now, we have brought them in on this entire process. So we've had a couple of different, probably had three different um, phone conference calls with uh, Brian Chuck from um, the FAA in Bismarck and uh, a call with um, uh, the state. And, and then we also included um, Sandy Depati, who is uh, running forecasting out of the Minneapolis ADO as well. So uh, we've, we've gotten a lot of people, at least a lot of eyes on this. They know what we're what we're doing and, and they're behind it as a whole. I mean, uh, basically the, the inventory of the existing facility is just not up to speed um, and, and everyone recognizes that from each ADO. Um, the other part of this uh, is kind of playing the, the, the politics behind it as well. And so um, what Todd has asked uh, uh, and what Todd will be doing actually is, is potentially asking the mayor to reach out to uh, some of our elected officials in Washington and provide the backing of, uh, of any state as well. Councilman. Mitchell, as we look at, if I look at these two things, you've got, uh, uh, you got the environmental assessment, not knowing what the outcome of that's gonna be. You've got the higher cost, and you also then ultimately have the timing of all of that, right, compared to the current location. Do those, three items or any one of them in any way you want to look at it adversely affect our probability of getting funding so in other words if we've got a 90 you know I'm going to obviously to crystal ball that right. we don't have right but do we have a 90% probability if we go current site and a 60% probability i don't i'm just throwing those numbers out 
Because to me, if I'm trying to make a decision, that probability is a huge issue for me. Well, I, th I think the, the probability for site option two, I don't think is, is anything. I think the probability of getting a supplemental grant for site option two is probably zero because of the EA. Because of the two years that that will likely take to complete that EA would forfeit our application for supplemental funds. Now the question is, if we, if, <laughs> it's one of those things where we could then ask for supplemental dollars at the lower amount in that site location, in our site option one location, and then we, we as a community would, would live with that terminal funded by a supplemental grant in that current location which is not a bad location by any means, it just has some drawbacks to it. Now if we were to not get the supplemental grant at that ask, then that opens up site option two. You know, we could come to the, com uh, come to the city council and ask for, uh, you know, ask you guys to seek an environmental assessment in that area. And then when it comes down to, uh, on the CIP, that terminal project is listed as 2021 and 2022, then you would have your EA done for that for that site option B, and, and you again as the city council in 2020, probably in that late 2020 time frame, would then look at what option works best at that time. I'm sorry, what about the funding? If we miss out on the supplemental funding initially, because that's 100%, correct? Yeah. Would then it, would the, the future funding uh, formula or, or the, the planning for that, <laughs> is that at the 90? 95.5 scenario, or is, does the city then have a much larger number? That that is something where uh, you would you would need to seek discretionary dollars from the FAA at that time, um, and that is never that's never a guarantee. But if you go, if in two years you are now asking for twenty or twenty million dollars, just as a round number, your entitlements that come at that ten thousand. Um, passenger threshold and you can bank up to three years of that so your entitlement dollars given to you by the FAA would cover three million dollars of that now what we would put in would be the FAA would probably come cover a lot of the site civil work there then it's a hundred percent eligible uh, or, or sorry ninety percent <coughs> eligible um, for that uh, I think the additional share of the terminal building would um, would then potentially be borne by uh, federal discretionary or local or state. So, uh, I'm sorry. If, uh, well, I'm just trying no, to look no, at it because this is on a me. pretty fast track from the, but as far as the application is concerned. But the, if we were to get the supplemental funding. Mm-hmm. And you described how that would go. Let's just say we got that. Doesn't matter which one it is. But yep. then we have our performance dollars that we get them one million dollars. What you want to call them board or, or employment numbers that we can bank. Um, what's the restrictions on how those dollars can be used? Because if we have to make changes, which are the infrastructures or or redo the road that goes in there you know maybe it's not a new one but it, maybe it's it's just redoing it it's a four lane with a nice median or something yeah right? absolutely can those things be used for that to, to then offset the city's out-of-pocket dollars so your current current emplanements are at one million dollars you just got it last year uh, and so you have nothing banked um, but regardless of that um, in the supplemental they will take your entitlement dollars for you know that year uh, anyway, so so you would you would have to use you would have to use as a part of that grant use up your your entitlements. We I completely agree with where Boy, you're going. Greedy, aren't they? I know. They give it to you and they take it away. I know. <laughs> but you're saying that there's a zero percent chance that we'd get that site too. I think because of the environmental assessment that they, they we wouldn't even go for it. For the application if we decide that that's what we want to do so we need to decide well if you may if you make the determination that that is really where you want to go then we'll focus elsewhere. then i guess we don't seek uh um, supplemental dollars at the october 31st deadline for the terminal project because 
I think what then you'd be doing is you'd be starting down the process of an EA at that site location, and then uh, and then we would complete our concept budget report with alternatives, with the uh, the civil layout of what we would be seeing, uh, and then. Uh, you know, within two years, you'd be banking entitlements. We would be talking to the FAA about discretionary uh, at that point in time. So, what which questions remain unanswered to make that decision? Um, is, this maybe is an airport board question. The, I mean, how would you're not clear? What would you need to see, Shan, to okay. um, convince you that we should go for site two? I guess I just want, I think the airport board wants some time. You know, we sent them out due diligence. Let's get us a, an, an A or B option. Let's not just accept A because it simply is. It was only after the board that they found this environmental assessment requirement. I, I mean, it changes everything <laughs> as far as I can tell. So I, what we've asked them is on Monday to get us, you know, like you said, the pros and cons to both. I, I think that that equation may have significantly changed or as we've heard right here I I guess I would like them to spend a couple of days to confirm this EA thing because we'd asked them to give us options before and they didn't have them at the two o'clock meeting and all of a sudden at four all of a sudden we find that we have you know this huge requirement that we didn't know existed before that almost makes it a clear answer but I think a little calm to let them go do a little more research come back to us on Monday uh, get us some read aheads and then we're meeting Tuesday at 12 I, if, if everything exists as it is right now, I, I guess I, I can't make a recommendation because I don't have my board here, but <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think maybe you're all seeing that it's fairly obvious. I, uh, but like I said, it was kind of a last minute in between meetings here, all of a sudden we find this. Well, the I, I don't think it's obvious necessarily. I mean, if, if truly site two is a better site, it's got to have some pretty... And that's what we were pushing for. I know like security concerns and after 9-11 and TSA, things are, when you put general aviation that close to commercial, some places are having, cities are having to hire security guards to come and meet private pilots at their plane and escort them into the FBO because they're just too close. Now, like I said, now we have all these options. Maybe we just move the FBO. I don't, we've got a, way too many things jammed in too close and that's why we were thinking this is the time. Uh, and it really isn't that much further from the industrial park, right? I mean, it was just right around the corner. No, it's essentially the same, same. route. In fact, I can't even picture the DOT allowing a second uh, roadway access. We'd probably have to just right. do something on our uh, airport improvement plan to put a road so through our airport right. off of this, the same outlet yeah. cut. So. Yeah, you know, and you drive those roads. I mean, there is a lot going on there. I know I drive out there all the time, and it feels like a one-lane or one-way road, but it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I've met people head-on in my lane. I, there's a lot going on, and if we're looking at possibly doubling passengers in the next 10, 20 years, it, it's not going to get better. I, now, there's many ways to cut this thing, and it's a fast track. So we're trying to go through this cost-benefit analysis and, and make a good recommendation from the airport board as quickly as we can. I don't think I can make any recommendation right now. I'd like to see all of that Monday and then have a good discussion Tuesday and certainly invite all of you to come and attend. And, well, and that gives them a couple of days to finish the application. Yeah. That would so be fine. part of that is moving along, not contingent upon the site, right? Or is it all contingent on the site location? Uh, the application would be contingent upon the site selection, yes, because uh, site selection two would be would be a significantly greater ask of the feds for money. You know, well, we we wouldn't be asking though. So I mean, if you're f oh true, great if, point. If we're picking site two, we're we're kind of realizing we're not asking anymore. I, I think that's I think that's accurate, and then it would just be a matter of if. Um, well, you know, there's this supplemental grant is out, I think, another year as well. So, I mean, you could you could look at uh, another another run at it um, uh, next year. But I know that the, the push has been to try to get, um, try to divvy this out quickly. And I think there are a lot of airports that are seeking, um, seeking dollars. Well, if we decided that we wanted to pursue Site 2, we would want to immediately 
begin the process of the <coughs> environmental assessment That's so we correct. can get those public hearings and letters sent out and waiting periods and all that started. Yep. And we don't have any money in the budget for that, but that's probably not a giant amount of money. Right. But 100? I'd say at least. Yeah, so again, another We'd scope it and, decision. And, and really detail what the, what the uh, process is and what we're looking at. Okay, so you're gonna be very busy in the next few days. Monday, a briefing, and Tuesday, a meeting. So, so we're sending all the information over to, uh, over to the airport, and Todd will distribute it to the airport board on Monday, and then I'll kind of soak it in and have a uh, meeting on Tuesday at noon. Okay. Is that a conference call? or At this point, yes. That's what, Tuesday? what I was anticipating would be a conference call. Um, if, I, if you'd like me here, I can, I can make the trip as well. We'll publicize that meeting. I would think the council would want to be there. I mean, if we had to, I suppose we could schedule a special meeting um, before the 31st if they really needed to act. Um, we'll be officially notified of that meeting for like an email to us then. Uh, can we be? Well, I'll try to remember. I'm, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I can. I've already sent it to Todd. Um, so Todd can. Um, okay. Todd can. Send that over to the. Okay. Todd, is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Well, this is a lot to think about. Pl plenty to plenty to chew on. I I know that it, it's big. Um, you know, this was a very quick quick process from the get go. Right. I mean, uh, I think your um, request for proposals was in August of this year. So we've been. Um, gathering data and coming up with, uh, you know, w with what we see as, as a reasonable and justifiable request for supplemental dollars for the terminal, um, you know, as it pertains to a second site, you know, that's a, uh, that throws a whole, um, a whole different scenario into it. So, um, but we will put together those numbers and look forward to um, getting anyone who can make it uh, at that meeting on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any other old business? We did have a little, I don't know if this is old business with our city hall being in the budget. It was uh, rather stinky today with our little hydrogen sulfide gas problem we've been dealing with. So... I don't know if that's neither here nor there, but. Well, Mayor, just comment on that. I know because I get asked about City Hall a lot, um, and we've kind of pushed that off, if you will. It's not an immediate need, and we've all, I think we've all agreed upon that. But that's happened a number of times, and, it, and it's not a very good working environment when that happens. So I would just comment to, to your comment that, you know, the City Hall is not tomorrow, but it, it's, it's coming. It's coming. I just think the public needs to be, to be aware of that. Uh, it's not tomorrow, but it, it's probably coming. Yep. It was kind of cold with the windows all open. <laughs> Any other old business or new business? See none. Um, any liaison member reports? Okay, we do have a need to go into executive session pursuant to SDCL 1-25-2 for personnel negotiations. So I'll look for a motion and second to go into executive session. Um, moved by Vilhar, second by Roby. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. We're in executive session. <clears throat> 